Welcome to this episode of the Here Now podcast on overpopulation. But hang, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Sorry about that. Is the earth becoming overpopulated? I'm guessing the majority of you are thinking, yes it is. But why do you think that is the case? It's an answer based partly on our intuitions. Population has grown in the past. It is growing now and surely it will continue to grow in the future. Therefore, the world will soon become overpopulated. It's an answer that's also based on our environment. We see it on television, we read about it in the news, we see images of seas of people, perhaps we observe it ourselves. We see waste and climate change, and all of the impacts of a human population growing and growing and growing. In the classic 1999 film The Matrix, Agent Smith lectures Morpheus on his revelation regarding the human race. Here is Smith with his trademark laconic drawl. I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species. I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. The only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. I love that scene. It's a classic moment when the viewer starts to question the morality of the entire Matrix universe. Smith really does have a point. Humans are a blight on the natural landscape of the Earth, and surely there must come a day when we simply run out of space. In this episode, I'd like to explore the idea of overpopulation, and put our intuitions to the test. Unfortunately, to do so requires us to explore a variety of statistics. We simply cannot address such an issue without looking at the numbers. But I'll try to keep this as interesting as possible, and hope to highlight some aspects of the question which may not be evident from your intuitions alone. So let's take my original question. Is the Earth really becoming overpopulated? Well, the answer is actually not as straightforward as you might think. In fact, I'm going to open with something of a bombshell. According to the United Nations, in 80 years' time, the population of the Earth will peak. Yes, in just 80 years, the global population will top out and then begin to decline. That is a surprising fact, and it's actually quite good news from a conservation perspective, not to mention quality of life. But unfortunately, that peak will be around 11 billion people. Today, the human population of Earth is around 7.5 billion, so we have to increase that by at least another 40% before we hit our ceiling. 40%! Okay, so that's a lot of people, even if it is a peak. It is almost double the number of people living on Earth today, and who knows how many will be living on other planets or moons by then. Let's hope quite a few. A few billion would be good. So yes, the short answer is we are probably overpopulating the Earth. But the real answer is far more nuanced and requires understanding what makes up that growth. Now, breaking down all of the growth rates by country would be an arduous and not particularly interesting exercise, and to be honest, it would offer few surprises. But in short, populations of the poorest countries continue to grow and will be the last to peak, while wealthier countries will grow at a much lower rate and peak sooner. But the rate at which global population is growing has actually been declining since about the 1960s, About the same time as Neil Armstrong took his famous first steps on the moon, the global population was growing by around 2.5% per year. Today, Earth's population is growing at about 1% per year, and by 2050 that will halve to just 0.5% per year. So even though we do have a lot of growing to do, most of it is going to happen in the next few decades. In fact, according to the UN, 
we will hit 10 billion by the year 2057, which leaves about 40 years to grow that final billion. So the peak of our population and all of the issues that will come with it is really a point for consideration in our lifetimes, depending on how old you are, of course. It is not some distant problem that our children's children will have to contend with, although they most certainly will. A growing population is a problem for everyone alive today. Most of us should be able to answer the following question. Which is the most populous country in the world? Yes, it is China. But what comes next? And then? Second is India, and that will soon overtake China to be the world's most populous country. But which is the third most populous? You might be surprised to learn it's actually the USA. Incredibly though, the US is growing by almost a million people a year solely from migration. So, a large part of their population is growing not from births succeeding deaths, but from people arriving from other countries. By contrast, China has an annual net loss of population due to migration of well over 300,000 people. So why then does America, which recently appeared to be quite anti-immigration, and perhaps still is, encourage so much migration? The answer is economics. Those extra people help to grow their economy, they pay taxes and contribute to the overall wealth of the United States. Now I'm sure there is a sophisticated cost-benefit analysis conducted by think tanks which looks at the potential costs associated with increasing population through migration. And of course, it's a significant political issue. But the numbers tend to speak for themselves. The US, for instance, has a gross national income of around $60,000 per person. China, on the other hand, has a GNI of $18,000 per person. In India, it's less than half of that. As long as the political landscape offers the opportunity to migrate from poor countries to rich, migration will always flow upstream. But this episode isn't about inequality. So let's come back to population and how it covers the globe. Are we really spreading like a cancer, as Agent Smith suggests? Human populations, not surprisingly, live predominantly in urban areas, around 55% of us. Now that still leaves a lot of people living in low-density areas, But that number will continue to decline as populations in cities grow and people migrate to cities to find work. By 2050, it is forecast that over two-thirds of us will live in cities. And when population reaches its peak in 2100, over 85% of people will be city dwellers. That's 9.3 billion people living in cities, more than double the number who live in them today. If you've ever been to Tokyo, Los Angeles, Shanghai, Istanbul, Bogota or Mexico City, you'll find it hard to imagine what another 4 billion people could look like. Cityscapes today extend from horizon to horizon, and many of them are really thousands of small communities living separately under the umbrella of the name of the city, but many people could live their entire lives without ever visiting another distant part of it. Being from one part of a city is as unique as being from one part of a country, and those divides will become even more distinct in the coming decades. Today, 95% of humans populate just 10% of the world's surface. I've spent thousands of hours flying around the planet, gazing upon vast tracts of wilderness and wasteland. You can fly for hours at a time over what appears to be nothing. Places like the Australian interior, northwest China, Mongolia, Russia, and northern Canada. There's just millions of square kilometres that are home to barely a soul. So it is not for lack of room that we are overpopulating the planet. In 50 years' time, I don't expect much will have changed on those long intercontinental flights, as it will be our cities that continue to grow. We will expand outward. Urban sprawl will keep sprawling, with major cities merging to become megalopolises, as seen in 13 regions of China today, including the Guangdong Pearl River megalopolis, which includes the cities of Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Shuhai, Hong Kong, Macau, and many others. This is an area about half the size of New York State, but it's home to three times as many people, some 70 million. Cities will also continue to grow upward. Futurists predict buildings climbing miles into the sky with many thousands of floors that are accessed by drones as elevators will take just too long to reach those higher floors. Imagine living in a building and never going beyond several floors above or below your own apartment. A city within a city within a city. Buildings on the scale may take some time to appear given that it's hard enough to find a decent tradesman to do up your bathroom. But there is no doubt space in cities will become ever more limited, and in no small part due to rising sea levels. So going up is really an inevitability. 
Perhaps another antidote to the coming loss of space will be access to great expanses in a virtual world where tiny homes simply become a place to eat, sleep and connect our avatars to the new real world we inhabit with our minds. Now we're talking about the Matrix again, but who knows? The reality of today was once the science fiction of yesterday. What we can be sure of is that there is no doubt the world is going to be a very different place in the coming decades. So we know the US population is growing, but it is not growing everywhere, and in some places it is even declining. In fact, between 2020 and 2100, the population of over 90 countries will decline. Yes, unbelievably, population decline has already begun in many countries, and it's been happening for some time. Today, some 25 countries have a population that is declining. There are several contributing social factors for this, but the main one is clear. People just aren't having as many children. The correct terminology is decidedly unromantic, but quite simply, the replacement fertility rate is on a downward trajectory. Obviously, if there are more deaths than births, populations will decline. One country with a well-known declining population is Japan, and Japan's population declined by about 450,000 people in 2018. This is put down to three key factors, a low birth rate, a so-called ultra-aging population, and very low immigration. Japan is one of the most homogeneous countries in the world, with one of the lowest foreign-born populations among developed countries. However, partly in response to its ageing and declining population, this is slowly changing, particularly in the larger cities like Tokyo, which is now home to increasing numbers of foreigners, some one in eight people say. An ageing population is not only an issue for Japan though. By 2073, it is forecast that globally there will be more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15. Improved living conditions and medical technology continues to contribute to prolonged lifespans. In 1950, the median age of all humans living was just 24. Yet by 2100, that will be 42. A child born today will literally live longer throughout the course of their own lifetime. That is to say, average life expectancy today is 71 years. But by 2100, it is projected to be anywhere from 81 to 100 years. Now this has remarkable implications for humanity, as some have coined the term encore adulthood to describe a new life stage that will come post-middle age but before old age, say over 65, where health, mobility and resources enable a far more productive period of time than has previously been experienced by humans. Now what will we do with these additional years? Will we work longer? Travel more? Read more? How much freedom will we really have? Now the downside from an economic perspective is that superannuation or retirement funds will have to last longer, and there's potentially a longer period of time when one goes from being a taxpayer to a consumer of national resources and public goods. For the individual, we have to hope that health technologies allow us to maintain a high and productive quality of life during those additional years. Obviously, medical advancements will have contributed in large part to providing those extra years, but it is no good living for longer, only to be miserable because some aspects of our bodies have reached their limits while we've prolonged our lives through the enhancement of others. Living longer doesn't necessarily imply remaining physically active for longer. And what about the social implications? Already we see the elderly left behind as technology has taken over our lives. Today, we observe an elderly population who grew up without computers, the internet, or maybe even TV. But perhaps that will be different as my generation reaches old age. Or will technology continue to revolutionise our lives in such a way that the elderly for generations to come will be condemned to thoughts of a distant past when life was simple and things didn't happen so fast? The elderly already experience isolation and alienation from a society rapidly speeding towards the future. But it is not just technology that changes with time. It's everything. Societies today are but a shadow of their former selves. Norms and value systems change with each generation Globalisation has made us more diverse, and distance is no longer a limitation to the merging of cultures as we live in a digital, high-speed and connected world. Value systems are forged in childhood, so how will we cope as we live to see the world changing around us? Will we be further alienated from the world we grew up in? And will those cultural aspects that are so integral to who we are hold us back? But returning to population decline, it's not a new issue. Russia has been tackling it for well over a decade. In 2006, President Vladimir Putin introduced incentive measures to encourage couples to have more than one child. These policies have been slow to take off due to a range of social issues. 
And unfortunately, the stereotype has been true, with alcohol-related health problems and death contributing a large part to the declining Russian population. However, in October last year, the World Health Organization issued a report stating that alcohol consumption in Russia has declined by over 40% since 2003 as a result of alcohol control and education programs. So that has to be a good thing. Unfortunately, it hasn't done much to slow the decline. Russia has also normalized abortion to the point of insanity. They have an abortion rate more than double that of most developed countries. Similar to Japan, Russia also has very low immigration, so it is unable to increase its population solely through organic growth. Now, this is having tremendous economic impacts on Russia, which is a massive country. And it's also one reason why Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine in 2014, boosting its population by over 2 million people. So we have seen that global population is growing, but at a declining rate, and many countries are already losing population every year. This trend will extend to the most developed nations in the near future. Due to people having fewer children, populations aging, and in some cases migration. But another 3.5 billion people will certainly have an impact on all of us. The level of that impact will in large part come down to our own culture, values, and behaviour. I remember several years ago, I was in Istanbul, the capital of Turkey. It's a beautiful bustling city that straddles the Bosphorus Strait, linking Europe with Asia. Istanbul is home to over 15 million people, and it's about four times the size of Los Angeles. I was standing on a street with a local, and the place was teeming with people. We were trying to figure out how to get to a certain place. The woman I was with began speaking to a gentleman standing next to us as we waited to cross the street. She spoke to him with such familiarity that I assumed she knew him, like he was a cousin or something. I asked her how she knew him as we crossed the street, and she replied that she didn't. She'd never seen him before. She was merely asking him for directions. I'd seen this phenomenon before. A level of social interaction that is indicative of a collectivist culture. Where I come from, people can be very friendly, but we also tend to enjoy our personal space and are polite but formal with strangers. Here, though, there was a great sense of community, and it was apparent to me that that is how 15 million people live together in this city. It seemed to me like that's the recipe for managing large populations, a we're all in this together mentality that must be imperative in order for people to live so closely together with scarce space and resources. Unfortunately, that's not a universal in these types of heavily populated cities. In China, for instance, there is a totally different approach to the issue. Yes, things are changing, and I'm generalising somewhat, but there, people do not appear to have a level of community and social cohesion like I observed in Istanbul. A queue? Well, that's merely an impediment to getting to the front. It's not a social construct that manages our needs in an orderly manner. It is somehow acceptable behaviour to push to the front, to shout and demand attention, oblivious to the many other people all waiting for the same thing. The approach is dog-eat-dog. For a collectivist country to have such a lack of social cohesion is strange to me, and what I consider a major flaw in Chinese society. But I'm not the only one to have noticed. The Chinese government itself is implementing a large-scale social credit system designed to force a shift in the values of its people. I'll explore this in more detail in a later episode. It's a fascinating and disturbing idea. But one reason it is disturbing is because it is a system that uses punishments to alter behaviour rather than appealing to the sense of community inherent to humans that has allowed us to merge together into societies for millennia. In my opinion, the solution to managing a growing population is first and foremost, community. We need to learn to be together better. It's what made us successful as a species, and it is why we have grown to the extent that we have. Isolating ourselves from others is not the solution. Unlike Neo in the Matrix, no one is the one. It is only by coming together, being open and understanding of each other and our differences, that we can find practical solutions to the challenges a growing population presents, and accept the inevitable changes that are coming. After all, everyone needs good neighbours. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Here and Now podcast. You can find us on Facebook at the Here and Now podcast or Twitter with the handle Here Now podcast. Please subscribe to keep up to date with the latest episodes and I'd appreciate your reviews on the Apple Podcasts app. I'd love your feedback on this or any other topics. You can reach me via the pages or at email theherenow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.